No worries, Tim, and thank you so much to everybody for attending. And I, I intend to honor your time um, with 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 these reflections. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, just just a researcher and and um, kind of been doing a bit of thinking about this area because. Uh, the, the, yeah, I've just seen a, a lot of stuff coming out and I'm just wondering, just it gets me thinking. So I thought, you know, put together some ideas and uh, this isn't definitive and it's just the start of a conversation, I think. So um, let me make sure we're going. All right. So, yeah, what? why why are we here? Um, I, I just want to have a conversation about this because I don't hear too much kind of critical thinking around it uh i see a lot of papers a lot of work um i just want to yeah i, I, I want to kind of step back and say you, you know what is it we kind of want to get from our research um can this stuff actually help with with our goals and you know i'm a bit skeptical that these tools are going to fix everything um and so i'd like to draw boundaries around when they're appropriate and when they're not appropriate uh, and, and we are talking here about research, uh, just just to be, you know, we're, we're on that topic of engineering research. And um, I guess, <laughs> you know, it's good to, to just step back for a second and think, do, do we really want to emulate human intelligence? <laughs> uh, and I like, I like this reflection from, from somebody who's obviously got some uh, wind turbines near them <laughs> and they're worry that the wind turbines are causing wind um so you know is, is that our goal uh, <laughs> to, to to reflect human intelligence but uh so so let's have a think about what our what our goal actually is right and um if i kind of like to think that you know the universe and the physical laws um are you know they're kind of a black box right the the we don't really know or, or you know we don't really know how it works but we have a, we have this idea of science, which is how we uh, try and look inside this black box uh, of the the universe's you know mechanisms and, and what goes on inside that black box. And you know we 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 have this definition that science is a you know systematic enterprise that builds and organizes knowledge. Um, but the key thing is that it produces testable explanations um, and predictions. Now. Predictions is not the same as a testable explanation. Um, so it's, you know, looking inside this black box and, and figuring out something that explains how it, it goes on. That's that's what we're after, I think. We're, we're after explanations. Um, and research is is the practice of science, isn't it? It's, it's the search for explanations. Um, and once we have those explanations, then um, we can make predictions. And through our predictions, then we can um, cultivate the world around us to 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 our needs, um, w which is what we've been doing. Um, so yeah, that's that's the the tool, right? So it's that search for for explanations that that we're after. And Richard Hamming and many engineers will know Richard Hamming is a fantastic uh, talk called "You and Your Research," and. He has this little bit in it where he's talking about that that he looks deep into the natures of 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 the problems that he's struggling with, and you know it's a constant effort to understand. And these words, you know, looking deeper into the nature of the problem, understanding more than the surface feature of a situation, um, is 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 that's what we're after, isn't it? You know, deep understanding, and um. When I think about engineering research and this, you know, as a small part of the scientific endeavor, um, I reflect that engineers um, are absolutely fantastic, <laughs> unashamedly uh, fantastic, because we, we have um, such an impact on society. You know, the, 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 somebody says engineers are the, actually, the only people that actually produce things or um, create ideas and products and um, solutions to societal problems. And uh, every, you know, other professions around us kind of then service those needs, but engineers really create. Um, 
And so we, we have a unique position and the research that we produce to inform the practice of engineering, um, that research, we have to recognize the impact it can have. It's, it's, it's remarkably significant. Um, and because we have such impact, and because our findings make their way into societal use, we have great responsibility. Um, it, we, we must understand what we're saying. We must be able to, to not only find something out, but we have to have that explanation. It's not enough to have a, a, a clause or an equation in a standard that we think works, uh, but we're not really sure. We must be able to explain cause and effect. Um, it doesn't seem a a high bar for our research that that we would have cause and effect and, and be able to explain it if if people are going to use it um and that that unique position of engineering research i think is is the context in which we have to look at what ai kind of an ml offer us right um so let, let's think a little bit more about what explanations are when when we talk about research when we talk about trying to explain things um, what, what is it we're, we're, we're looking at? And I, I just want to step back and, and have a look at some some kind of, you know, we think it's easy. It's not. Um, so here's a, you know, a headline. Uh, is baldness a risk factor for COVID-19? Um, men have completely lost their hair. 40% more likely to end up in hospital with COVID-19. So obviously having hair is great protection against uh, COVID-19. Um is, is that an explanation? What, what's actually going on here? And if I, you know, maybe draw what's known as a, a DAG, a directed acyclic graph, which might try and explain what's actually going on here. Um, and we have what's known as a, as a confounder, um, which is age. Um, and what has happened here is observations have been made between the incidence of COVID-19, observations have been made between balding, and those two variables um, have an implied association because they have a common cause, which is age. Um, and, and that is an explanation. That's what we're after here. So simply getting some data and looking at associations isn't an explanation. Uh, so let's have a look at another one. And this one, um, you know, I want to emphasize this is not easy stuff. Um, this is uh, from a publication that was uh, a paper published in Nature. Um, a significant collaboration between the University of Pennsylvania, Children's Hospital in Pennsylvania. Um, night lights uh, need to myopia, nearsightedness, right, in young children. And um, this was in 1999. As you can imagine, it got a lot of headlines. Um, and parents, of course, began to take lights out of rooms all around the world. So these things have absolutely big, big impacts, right? But what, what's actually going on here? And I'll be honest, when I read this first, I, I didn't know what was going on. And it takes a little bit of thinking about it, but you know, probably when I flash it up on the screen, it'll be very obvious. Um, myopic parents, parents who are short-sighted, will use nightlights to help them maneuver around a room. Um, parents who are short-sighted will tend to have short-sighted kids. And so the use of nightlights and the short-sighted kids, they're associated. Um, it's not obvious, right? It takes a bit of thinking about. It. It's not easy. Explanations are not easy. And I've got another one here. And this one, this one's a real, a real, a real doozy. So this is a Belgian study uh, where we're saying living near parks and gardens raises children's IQ. That's isn't that wonderful? Uh, we just get our kids out into some green spaces and they get smarter. Um, and this, again, published in a very prestigious journal, PLOS Medicine, 3% uh, 3. 3 increase uh, in, in green space, um, you, you know, results in a 2.6 rise in overall IQ. And again, you know, these are significant studies led by teams of researchers, right? Um, this stuff is not easy. I just want to emphasize that because I don't want to make it seem like it kind of, in retrospect, these things can become easy. So what's actually going on here? Well, let's, let's see if we can think about what, what are the confounders on this one. Um, if you have smart parents, you will probably have smart kids. But we do know also that smart parents tend to have higher income. And if you have higher income, you will probably choose to live in desirable places to live and living near green spaces and parks is desirable. 
Uh, and so you end up with an association between smart kids and kids who live near parks. Uh, but it has these common confounders in there. Uh, they're dash because they're not observed. Uh, we, we've, we've got data on the bottom two boxes. Um, we think they're correlated, um, but they're not observed. Uh, sorry, the, the confounders are not observed. So look, you've heard it before, but I hope uh, we've emphasized or emphasized for you now that correlation is not causation. So simply observing associations between things is not an explanation. It is uh, not causation. We have in the real world, very complex confounding and mediation of observations by unobserved parameters. Um, the unobserved parameters bit is something I'll come back to in a moment when we steer towards engineering research. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the point is it's, it's not quite straightforward. So if we seek to understand or to explain, we have to have that causal model in our mind. Uh, the DAGs that I showed are causal models. They help to explain the um, the uh, what what Judea Perra calls the listening. You know what variables are listening to what variables. Um, causation is is a one way arrow. It's it's not two ways. Um, something causes something else. It doesn't it doesn't go backwards. Not symmetrical. Um, and to try and figure out data, we have to have that causal model in mind. And, and that data that we've seen, those studies, they only make sense once we've framed that causal model in mind. So what is, what is you know, causation? Um, how can we kind of get into that a little bit? Um, so I want to just look at a hypothetical case study here and set the scene for uh, engineering um, in, uh, you, you know, AIML. Um, and what I've got here is some, you know, imaginary data. Um, I've got, uh, you know, maybe a bridge. Uh, I've got some measurements of corrosion depth across the, sorry, not one bridge. This is the, a network of bridges. Um, I've got corrosion depths here um, on my, my ordinates and, and maintenance spend uh, on, on my abscissa. Uh, so the asset owner has collected all this data and they're drawing a line through it and they're saying, hang on a second, the more I spend, the more corrosion I get. So clearly the solution here is to stop spending money because I'm causing corrosion by, by spending money, maintaining my, my, my assets. Um, what, what's going on here? Like, how can this be? What's the engineering decisions that I need to make from this point? Because clearly spending money is causing the problem. Um, so why don't we have a little think? Um, let's go talk to some domain expertise. Um, what's go wh why do we need to talk to domain expertise? Well, because the data is not the entire story. We need a causal model of the world in our minds as we approach this data. So our domain expertise might come along and suggest that, hang on a second, um, maybe age has something to do uh, with the amount of corrosion that's taking place uh, and the amount of spend that you're, 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 you're spending on, on the maintenance aspects, right? So, so maybe you're observing an implied association. Okay, right. So maybe if we condition on age, if we get this extra data point of age and condition on age, let's have a look at what happens then. Um, and we have the very same data, but this time we've segregated it by age. And what we see is that once we have identified the subpopulations of age in the global set of data, we end up instead of the positive uh, slope or relationship, we end up with this negative uh, correlation. Uh, in other words, conditional on a bridge being around 100 years old, the more I spend, yes, corrosion reduces, right? Now, the data hasn't changed. This is the very same data. What has changed is that we've approached it with a causal model in mind. We've approached it with domain expertise in mind. And so I kind of argue that data only makes sense once you have this causal model in your mind and you approach it in that manner. And the phenomenon on the screen here is something known as Simpson's paradox. And I'd encourage you to go and, and have a look uh, at that. It crops up everywhere in, in, uh, in, in statistics. And it's very confusing for lots and lots of people. 
so what, what's going on? So um, I mentioned Judea Pearl, and he has kind of categorized what causation is. And he's got something wonderful called the ladder of causation. And it's the framework within which we can kind of begin to conceptualize on the collection of data and modeling and so on. So the, the lowest rung of his ladder is seen. Um, this is where we simply go out and we get data, we observe it, and we begin to make associations from the various data inputs. And we've seen that already. We've um, done as analysis, we've done some regressions, and essentially all AI and ML sits in this space. It's associational. They are impressively massive regression engines, but regression nonetheless, okay? So they simply take data and they work out associations uh, between data. Even, even the biggest ML model right now, GPT-3, 175 billion neurons, as everybody likes to talk about as a, as a neural network. Um, uh, it, it is a regression engine. Uh, it's, it's an autoregressive model uh, on text, uh, and that's all it is. Um, so observing, seeing is the very lowest rung of uh, causation, and um, it, it is insufficient to explain. Uh, the next rung uh, on his ladder of causation is, is doing. Uh, and doing is when we make interventions, uh, when we conduct experiments and make observations on the results of those experiments, when we conduct randomized control trials. Um, so we're quite privileged in engineering because we get to conduct experiments and set parameters. Uh, in other fields, they don't get to do that. In medicine, for example, they can't exactly reach into your arteries and set your blood pressure. Um, and so hence we have randomized control trials, which are an attempt to try to control for uh, various variables that are in there. In engineering, mostly we can control for some of our variables. Interventions change the world, right? But we, we continue to observe the changed world. We've intervened, we make an observation. Uh, it's a, it's, it is a realized changed world. And um, again, I'm you know, no expert, but as far as I'm aware, the only AI ML that sits in this space is known as reinforcement learning. And we'll see an example of that in a few minutes. So interventions um, are that second level, but we're still not there. That's still not an explanation. Um, and we get then to the third level, uh, which is imagining. And imagining is kind of the, the, the nice way of thinking about counterfactuals. Uh, counterfactuals are, of course, counter to the facts. They did not happen. They are what ifs. Imagine what might have been. They uh, contradict observations. By definition, counterfactuals can never be observed. And simply put, there is no AI ML that can do this. But counterfactuals are how we make explanations. Indeed, counterfactual thinking is how humans you know, our thought to derive a model of the world. And that's how kids uh, learn how the world works. Um, kids, you know, playfully intervene in the world and that's at level two. And by doing so, they begin to ask themselves questions. They construct a model in their mind. They say, well, what if I hadn't have, you know, stuck my finger in the socket? Um, uh, those kind of questions are, uh, and the answers to those questions that humans find so easy to answer, um, uh, they are where explanation lives. Uh, and I've probably jumped my <laughs> slide because I'm saying, uh, yeah, the, you know, counterfactuals are where explanation lives. It's where understanding grows. And um, it is what we need to be hitting if we are producing research that is uh, answering uh, or, or fit for purpose in the sense that it creates explanations that allows us to go and have impact on society. Um, those what if questions um, are, are, yeah, uh, absolutely key. And I'll give, I'll give one example because I know that's a bit abstract. So, so let's, uh, let, let's take an example um, that's, a, that's a real thing. So when we think about uh, legal liability, right? So uh, am I liable for something? And there is a, it's known as the but for test in law. And uh, it, it is simply say, uh, but for the actions of the defendant, the victim would be alive. And this is a counterfactual because the victim is dead. Um, the defendant did something. The victim is dead. Um, is the defendant liable? Um, and we ask ourselves to conceptualize or imagine a universe in which the defendant did not take the action that they took. And in that universe, if the victim is alive, well, that means in our present, 
in our universe, the universe that we actually observed, yes, the defendant is liable. So counterfactuals, um, the but for questions, the, the universes that didn't happen are our path for understanding. Um, in terms of engineering, um, you, you know, we might ask ourselves, you know, but for the overloaded truck, um, would the bridge have collapsed? Uh, perhaps it was already corroded. Uh, maybe the uh, truck driver wasn't particularly overloaded. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, maybe the, the liability then doesn't sit there because in that alternate universe where the bridge didn't collapse, perhaps it would have collapsed tomorrow anyway. And so they are the kind of explanations. Um, the counterfactual realm is where we we have those explanations. Um, I suppose touching on liability then, we, we, you know, and recognizing that AI doesn't hit counterfactuals, um, it does raise the question, um, you know, as engineers, of course, we take, uh, we are responsible, um, we are liable. Uh, it does ask the question, and can we actually make decisions that are AI ML supported? Um, but that's a broader question for, for, for the, the whole um, profession, I think, rather than just researchers. So just moving on to um, machine intelligence then. So, you know, now that we've kind of got a bit of a picture of, you know, what we're looking for from our research, I think, and um, how we go about explaining things and, and what the lateral causation looks like. And um, so, so, you know, I, I like this, this graphic where um, we're really trying to think about what we do with data. And, you know, data comes in and kind of a big messy pile and we try and, you know, sort it and arrange it, and we might even present it. Um, but it's that last step, that that last step that explains, that puts the structure, the framework on it, that creates the model uh, that explains what all that data means, what it represents, um, why it works. Um, and it's that last step that I think we have an obligation to hit in our research. Um, but it's that last step that AIML actually can't do. Um, and so I, you know, that's that's what I'm kind of thinking. And um, look, I, I I'm I'm now AIML expert, but but just you know to point out neural networks, even they're basically elaborate Bayesian networks, which is simply again a conditional probability uh, exercise, um, lots of associations, um, correlations in there. Um, there is a a move uh, towards what's known as semantic regression, where uh, formulas are actually applied to the data uh, to see if, what kind of um, expression can fit the data. Um, Max Tegmark in, in, in MIT, uh, a, a really good paper where they've managed, with, with data, they've managed to replicate about 100 equations of Feynman's lectures in physics. Uh, again, it's semantic regression, but it's still, it's still associational. Uh, it still isn't uh, an explanation. Um, it, it might even, you know, make predictions, and I'll, I'll touch that. So, um, yeah, we need to be careful. And look, one... One thing I kind of see a little bit is is we, we all get very impressed by by the fangs. Um, we think that if they're doing it, uh, it must be good, right? Um, well, I'd, I'd just like to kind of say, no, don't be too impressed, right? Because the algorithms that these guys use, um, the recommendation engines, um, they don't need to care about a model. They don't need to have an explanation of why users click a button uh, if the page looks like this more than uh, if the page looks like something else, right? All they care about is, is the outcome. And all they care about is those reasonable predictions. Um, so associational level uh, work is sufficient for these. So when we hear about Amazon and Google and Netflix and Facebook all using AI ML, it, it you know, it doesn't impress me too much in the sense that it doesn't mean that I can then go and use that in my research because they sit at the first level of the ladder of causation, whereas we need to be hitting the third level. Um, so they they fall short, right? So model-free, data-driven um, explanations of the world or, or, or observations of the world are not necessarily the right path for, for research, I think, you know. Um, the, the next step, though, is, is 
you know, thinking about those those interventions that we might do. Um, I gave the example about you know the maintenance on the bridge and and the uh, the spend uh, and trying to arrest corrosion. Well, so so let's say I do go and and train my AI model uh, on corrosion and spend, um, and I make predictions. Well, of course, the predictions. The first thing I do with the predictions then is I act on it. I intervene, and as soon as I've intervened. <laughs> The model is nullified uh, because now I've changed what the model was based upon. Uh, so unless I'm going to use reinforcement learning, which is a very niche topic, um, I, I, the, the, the associational AI ML uh, can't actually help me. Once I get out there and paint that bridge, the associational um, regression engines um, are, are no longer kind of of use to me unless I go take new data. So that's kind of something that's not, I guess, touched on too much, I think, um, certainly from what I've seen. But hitting that counterfactual uh, point, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious that I think engineers have been a little bit spoiled because our world is mostly made up of physical laws and physical laws inherently address counterfactuals. So we are so used to the rules around us already hitting the third level, the third ladder, uh, the third rung in the ladder of causation. So we, we begin to see the whole world as, exp as, as, at, as being at that third ladder or third step. Um, you know, here we've got Hooke's Law. Uh, if I double the mass, I double the elongation. Um, you know, that, that, that works. And I can ask myself the, the hypothetical world where if I had halved the mass instead, what would the elongation have been? And I can answer that question because I have a physical model. It answers counterfactuals. And we're so used as engineers to, these, to being able to answer these counterfactual questions that we begin to think that everything can answer counterfactual questions. And I'm not sure it can. Um, Sometimes people will say, well, what about, what about if, if we're able to make really good predictions? And um, I, I kind of stole this idea from Richard McElreath. And some of you might be familiar with George Box's kind of thing. All models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, and what we have here is, is the geocentric model uh, of, of the solar system um, where the Earth is at the center. And this is Ptolemy's work. Uh, and we see the little epicycles on each of the planets. Um, and... You know, Ptolemy did, did his work, you know, 2,000 years ago, even more, and it's remarkably accurate. It makes very good predictions, right? Um, he essentially introduced enough epicycles that he, he produced a Fourier series to explain the motions of the planets, and it works. From observations from Earth, it works. Now, the Copernican model uh, on the right, where um, it's not quite clear in the graphic, but, but each orbit um, actually has a different center, um, it, they're not actually all concentric on the sun. The Copernican model actually has more parameters than the Ptolemy's model. And it only marginally produces better uh, predictions. And so by Occam's razor, we, we should never have actually adopted Copernicus's model because the predictions are more or less equivalent. Um, and yet it has more parameters. So we, we should have chucked it, right? The point is that Predictions are not the measure of explanation because I can have perfectly good predictions from a completely wrong model. And so predictions even are not the measure of explanation. So we have to do better. So look, I like to be a bit skeptical. I spoke about engineering researchers have this unique responsibility to explain our outputs because of our potential impact. And I'm concerned that the use of AI and ML you know, well, I think it should never obscure our understanding. It should only enhance it. So however we use it, it's got to be a way that provides a pathway towards explanation and understanding. It cannot be the end goal in itself. Um, because I think what will happen there is you've got a lot of associational evidence. Uh, it might even make accurate predictions, but it is in no way is an explanation. And I think we owe uh, society uh, an explanation if we're going to um, make decisions based on these kind of outputs. And uh, here's a recent fantastic success. I don't want to just beat, up, beat on it, right? Um, this is a paper in Nature uh, just last week. 
you may have seen it. So this is out of uh, DeepMind AI in, in London, which is, uh, I think it's a Google. Uh, they were purchased by Google. What, what they did with this is, is they used um, reinforcement learning. So we're, we're at last, uh, rung two of the ladder, right? But they use reinforcement learning in a learning loop with a simulated fusion reactor environment. And it learned a control law um, it, it, but by it being able to interact with it with, 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 it, with the simulation, it learned a control law, and then they actually deployed that control law to a real nuclear fusion reaction uh, in in the UK, uh, and they were able to sustain um, this this plasma uh, for for ten or fifteen minutes, right? And you know this is absolutely remarkable, and it it is being held up as a real great success for AI, and 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 it is. And um, what they've done is is they've managed to avoid the need to create an incredibly complex control law, um, which is which is temporal and three dimensional, um, and and they did it by by reinforcement learning at at, at rung two. But to my mind, what what they what they've done here is really good because. It's simply a tool that they have used in order to to achieve a higher order objective, right? And that's fine. Let's use our tools to to make uh, to, to to achieve something. Um, that's why I think this is a success. Uh, the AI wasn't the end in itself; it was simply a, a stepping stone on the path. So, uh, just to close up, then um, on our journey, I, I kind of want to point out that we cannot derive understanding from associational evidence. Um, even uh, if, if we, you know, intervene, uh, it can still be, be problematic, as, as we've seen. Um, um, I think we will always require that model as the embodiment of understanding and explanation. Um, and I think, you know, engineering research, which will lead to engineering practice, um, we need to figure out a way to absorb AI or ML uh, decision making. Um, I'll come back to the black box that we started with. If the universe is a black box, it seems to stand to reason that we can't use a black box to look inside a black box. I mean, it, you know, if you think about it, um, it doesn't, it can't really add up, can it? So what I would like, you know, broadly or, or you, you know, as colleagues um, and all of our fields of research are slightly different, uh, and I'd like to, to for us to think about what are the questions, you know, as even as peer reviewers, what are the questions we should ask of research that leverages these tools? I don't even know what those questions should be. I mean, you know, is, is it a stepping stone along the way? Are they using it just as a tool? Or is it simply applying this stuff because it's cool and trendy? Um, also, in different fields, we have different roles of causality, and I'm not sure that's a conversation we have enough. I think because we've been spoiled as engineers, because most of our physical models have causality uh, as, as, a, as a neat side artifact. But as we progress into more and more complex domains, um, it's not always given that uh, we are at rung three on Perl's ladder of causation. Um, but, you know, broadly, generally then, so, so how can those associational tools that support model building, which if we agree that, understand, that models are required for explanation and understanding, how can associational tools support building of models? I, I don't know how, I don't know how that, that can be done either. Um, and look, at <laughs> the, the, the final thing is, is you, you know, we, we can very quickly turn a cat into guacamole um, if, if we're not careful. Uh, it, it doesn't take much to throw these things off. So, so we really have to be, have to be cautious uh, as engineers with a responsibility to, to society if, if our research is going to have the impact I think most of us desire it to have. Um, these are uh, some of the books that, that I find particularly stimulating. Um, I'd, I'd really encourage kind of people to, to, to get out there and read them. And, uh, but the book of why, uh, Judah Perl's book is absolutely wonderful. Um, philosophy of science course, uh, and Michael Reed's statistical rethinking are, I think really essential reading as we, as we begin to, to get into domains where basic physical laws are, are not so simple, uh, to, to, to apply, uh, as, as our research kind of increases in complexity. Uh, so that's it. Thank you. Um, 
hope you found it worthwhile and you know let, let's uh, let's have a conversation and, and let's see where it goes um, thanks for your attention <laughs>